rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. He is risen. Happy Easter, church, and welcome to all of our visitors. You know, I know it's Easter, but you still get full church credit for coming today. So yes. thank you for coming. We Absolutely. love you. Absolutely. <laughs> so happy to have Cohen here. Hi, Cohen. Can you say hi? Hi, hi Rissy Kerbin. Classic. <laughs> Don't forget it. Okay. And uh, Haven's got braces, which is awesome. Well, anyway, we're so great. Yeah. I got it. Cool. Very cool. Well, we're so glad you're here today. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you so, so much for your goodness. We're so thankful that you love us, God, just as we are, not as we should be. We don't have to change in any way yet. God, first, you just save us by your, your good work, and we thank you for that. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would begin that process in our lives even today. I thank you that Everyone is here because you wanted them to be here. Everyone watching on television or on their phones, wherever they are, I believe you have a word for them. And I ask for that in Jesus' name. Lord, we love you. Amen. 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 Turn to the person next to you and say, He is risen. He is risen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. This Easter season, Hannah and I want you to know that you have a family and we invite you to come home. God's message to you is that you are loved and you are his chosen. He is your friend and you are the apple of his eye. Nothing you go through can separate you from his amazing love. That's right, Easter means victory. Jesus is victorious over death. When I reflect on the struggles I faced in my past, I can see that God reigned triumphant in all of them. And when I look at my current challenges, I have faith that the victory is already won. He has the final say in the circumstances of my life and in yours. Friends, whatever struggle you may be facing, God's arms are strong enough to carry it. The resurrection matters because Jesus is alive today and he's working in and through you. You have a divine destiny and your best days are ahead. To empower you in your walk with God, we've created special resources to help strengthen your bond with Jesus and equip you to share your faith with others. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, PO Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. As Jesus makes our spirits come alive this Easter season, he invites each of us to renew our vision, realize our dreams, and join him in the vital work of expanding his kingdom, both here and around the world. This is the mission of Hour of Power, and it's why you are such a blessing to us. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we.
Kevin Rose. That was amazing. Thank you. In preparation for the message, Matthew 28, 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Church, he has risen. risen Amen.
Thank you for joining us in worship today. This Easter season, Hannah and I want you to know that you have a family and we invite you to come home. God's message to you is that you are loved and you are his chosen. He is your friend and you are the apple of his eye. Nothing you go through can separate you from his amazing love. That's right, Easter means victory. Jesus is victorious over death. When I reflect on the struggles I faced in my past, I can see that God reigned triumphant in all of them. And when I look at my current challenges, I have faith that the victory is already won. He has the final say in the circumstances of my life and in yours. Friends, whatever struggle you may be facing, God's arms are strong enough to carry it. The resurrection matters because Jesus is alive today and he's working in and through you. You have a divine destiny and your best days are ahead. To empower you in your walk with God, we've created special resources to help strengthen your bond with Jesus and equip you to share your faith with others. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, PO Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland. 1344 or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website hourofpower.org.nz. As Jesus makes our spirits come alive this Easter season, he invites each of us to renew our vision, realize our dreams, and join him in the vital work of expanding his kingdom both here and around the world. This is the mission of Hour of Power, and it's why you are such a blessing to us. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain Desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. Could he 
mean, the music is always good, but you guys really pull it out for Christmas and Easter. I mean, wow, wow. When Kevin was singing earlier, it sounded like a choir of like a hundred behind him. And it was just beautiful thinking of all of heaven declaring that, all of us declaring that. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Praise his name forevermore. Church, would you join me as we bring our praise to God through prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Because of today, we have hope. Because of today, we don't fear death. Because of today, we keep moving forward. Lord, today is a celebration. Today is a party. Today is a day that we say thank you. For today is a day that brings life. Lord, we thank you for what happened on this day. That death was defeated. That Jesus rose from the dead. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And Lord, we thank you that that same power, that same strength is given to us, that we can bring that to the world. And so, Lord, let it be so. Let us be a people. Let us be a church that goes out from this place to make a difference in the world. Let us put Jesus on display in our very beings. Let us put him on display in our friendships and in our relationships, in the way we drive, in the way we shop, in the way we interact with those we don't know. Let us put Jesus on display. Lord, we pray for our church. Let it be a beacon of hope, a beacon of love to this world. We pray for our country. We pray for our world. We pray for your church in all of its many forms gathering today in person, virtually, in secret, in public. Let us be united in putting Jesus on display. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Bobby. We pray for the message that you have placed on his heart. May we have ears to hear and hearts that are open to what you are doing in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. This Easter season, Hannah and I want you to know that you have a family and we invite you to come home. God's message to you is that you are loved and you are his chosen. He is your friend and you are the apple of his eye. Nothing you go through can separate you from his amazing love. That's right, Easter means victory. Jesus is victorious over death. When I reflect on the struggles I faced in my past, I can see that God reigned triumphant in all of them. And when I look at my current challenges, I have faith that the victory is already won. He has the final say in the circumstances of my life and in yours. Friends, whatever struggle you may be facing, God's arms are strong enough to carry it. The resurrection matters because Jesus is alive today and he's working in and through you. You have a divine destiny and your best days are ahead. To empower you in your walk with God, we've created special resources to help strengthen your bond with Jesus and equip you to share your faith with others. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, PO Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland. 1344 or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website hourofpower.org.nz. As Jesus makes our spirits come alive this Easter season, he invites each of us to renew our vision, realize our dreams, and join him in the vital work of expanding his kingdom both here and around the world. This is the mission of Hour of Power, and it's why you are such a blessing to us. Thank you, and remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. We're so glad you're here. Welcome. Would you stand with me? We're going to say this creed together as we do every single week. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. 
I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. That's the gospel, by the way, that the way you get into heaven is not by acting good. The way you get into heaven is by trusting your life to the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. Every religion in the world has sort of a, a balance sheet of your life, that if your good works in whatever cosmic way outweigh your bad works, you go to heaven, not in Christianity. That's actually considered a heresy in Christianity. We believe that no one's good enough. That, that w that's how we're all equal. That we're all a bunch of sinners and that we need Jesus. And, and when we're saved by him, our life is a response to the fact that he loves us as children. You see, he loves us just as we are, not as we should be. And then our life is a poetic response to, to building goodness, making good decisions uh, around the fact that we're grounded in his grace, his love, his kindness and compassion for us. So it's not about becoming perfect overnight. It's about, you know, a process of becoming the person God called you to be. And, and that's, if you hear anything today, just hear that, 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 that being saved, that going to heaven, it really is, is just saying yes to coming home to the Lord. It's just saying, yes, I will be your beloved daughter. Yes, I will be your beloved son. And watch what do God does with that. I'm convinced as I get older, I'm not that old, 39, I guess I'm middle-aged, I'm somewhere in the middle between everybody, I guess, but I'm, I'm becoming convinced that um, older people don't like being lectured to by younger people. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, this is, this is true for every age group. So I remember watching my grandpa being lectured to by my dad about whatever, church or health, and just seeing... My, my grandpa's face get redder and redder and, and countenance get sterner and sterner. I noticed it recently when I was lecturing my dad on the same type of thing. And then I thought about it when my daughter was lecturing me about something. We, we had an argument about how to spell the word conscience. And she swore that there was an SH in conscience. And I was like, it's con science. It literally means with knowledge. She's like, con science? Then why don't we say con science? <laughs> and then I joyfully watched as her nephew, who is a four-year-old, was lecturing her about something or other having to do with Pokemon. She was sure she was right. Anyway, my point is that no matter how old or young you are, you don't want somebody younger than you lecturing you about stuff. Am I right? Everybody. And uh, I think, and I just came to this idea this morning, I think... You know, I mean, you guys know I love, in a very dorky way, I love history. And I think that's maybe what we do to our historic ancestors. We sort of proverbially lecture those who came before us. Like, we're the enlightened ones. And when you study history, you recognize people in the past are not as dumb as we think they were. <laughs> a lot of people think people were dumb. They weren't. And in fact, they might actually have been smarter than we are in many ways. It's amazing what television and an iPhone can do to your intelligence. <laughs> and it's not a good thing. It's kind of like we think today that people didn't know apples fell from trees before Isaac Newton, or people didn't know the earth was round before Christopher Columbus. They did, by the way. They were able to prove it mathematically 500 years before Jesus. And there's some pretty good evidence that most people thought the world was round anyway during that time. But it's like, uh, I think it's Taleb, the philosopher, that said that he made a really great case in an essay where he showed that most great scientific breakthroughs were either made on accident or by tinkering. And then universities came in and showed mathematically how it was possible and then took credit for it all. And so he calls it lecturing birds on how to fly. As said, the academic community tends to have this, you know, this way of thinking of themselves. But all that to simply say, I really believe the testimony of the disciples that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. I really believe that. That the hundreds of people that witnessed Christ being raised from the dead is, a, is an actual testimony we can rely on. And I believe that because I've decided to stop insisting that those that came before me were not as smart as I am. You know, the people in Galilee, Galilee, the Jews of those days especially, were incredibly educated people. They had been Hellenized for almost 400 years before Christ came, which means they had an education in rhetoric, mathematics, logic. Most people who were not religious, like Jewish religious, 
were not, like we think they were, like all the Romans were super pagan. They really weren't by the time Jesus came. They were mostly philosophers, a-religious, or a lot of the religious stuff was more of a political thing. You, you did have regions that were very pagan, but like they weren't pagan like the Vikings were pagan, you know, were nailing people to trees or the way sub-Saharan African tribes were pagan. They were just kind of, you know, they were more philosophers. And education was such a key part of that world. And Galilee itself was a wealthy region. It wasn't rural. I mean, there was some rural stuff, but there was an influx of people coming in, mostly Jews, coming in from Babylonia, which is one of the wealthiest, most educated places in the world. They were coming from Alexandria, parts of Asia Minor. And it was just a flood of education and culture. And by the way, those people would have spoken four languages. Aramaic, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Okay, they, they're not that dumb. And my point is, it's like we act like they didn't know back then that people don't come back to life. <laughs> they did. They knew that. And I guess that's what I'm saying is when you study the original sources of how the Roman Empire was, they did, we always, a lot of pastors, you hear it sound almost like the Roman Empire was out there hunting down Christians. They didn't want to kill Christians. They wanted nothing to do with it. It was a chore for them. In most cases, when many of the disciples, apostles, and witnesses of the resurrection were tortured and killed, it, they were given so many outs. There was like, there's many sources even that show that you know, they would say something like, if you just, you know, just tell me, just sign this thing, just sprinkle some sulfur on this little fire, just do it in front of me, and you go back to your church, you can preach your religious stuff, dude, I don't care, I just want to go, I just want to get back to work. There's a lot of, this is a modern way of saying it, of course, but there's a lot of that type of thing happening. And all of these people joyfully went to their deaths, hundreds of people. Okay, to me, that, that is worthwhile, and I believe I truly believe Jesus is alive, that he's doing a good work. I believe that A.D. and B.C. or C.E. and B.C.E., that, that the whole measurement of time is snapped like a twig around one person's life for a reason. And I believe that God is doing a good work in your life, and I believe you're supposed to hear what I'm saying today, that if you rely on him, you don't have to worry about your death. You don't have to worry about the world as much, you, you worry about drawing closer to him and becoming more like him and trusting in his spirit, doing a good work in your life. So all that to say, he's alive. And he loves you just as you are, not as you should be. And he's searching after you. And this is the, this is the message Jesus gives us. Have you ever lost something like really important and you can't find it and it's driving you crazy and then you finally find it and you're just stoked out of your mind that you found this thing that you were looking for? That's how Jesus describes the gospel when we come to know him. This happened to me not that long ago. We live in a house that's really technically an apartment, but it's not. It's a house, but it's, it's in an area where I have to walk to the end of my block. To, to, there's 12 mailboxes and I have to use a key to open my mailbox. You can't just open it. And the key, of course, is tiny and it's a dark color. It's like designed to be lost. And I have a son who loves to misplace my things on purpose. <laughs> I remember once I couldn't find a key. It had already been like three days since I checked the mail. I'm looking everywhere for the stupid key. I turned the house upside down. We turned the couch upside down. I'm looking through everything. I can't find the stupid key. Now it's been like a week. And I'm just picturing my tiny little sliver of a mailbox packed full of mostly junk. You know, it's going to be like, you know newspaper clippings, some coupons for something I don't need, and of course, Hour of Power soliciting me for a donation. <laughs> anyway, so I, so I, just tons of junk, you know, and I, I've, and so finally one day I'm walking Cohen out to the, to the bus, and I had grabbed a jacket, it was a little cold, and as I'm walking back, I slipped my hands in my pockets because my hands were a little cold, and what did I feel but a tiny little key? And I didn't walk, I ran back to the house. Hey, Hannah! I found it! You see, and this is the kind of image that Jesus uses in the text I'm going to talk about today. It's a short sermon today, you know, I'm almost done, actually. I'm halfway done, believe it or not. But, uh, but it's Easter, we know that there's mimosas and ham in store for you, and I don't want to get in the way between you and your... You and, you and your family time, but but uh, Jesus is, is, is interesting because uh, Jesus is eating and drinking with sinners. Now, the sinners the Bible is talking about are real sinners. Most of them are actually bad guys. Like, you would consider them bad people, especially tax collectors. These are people 
that are like the scammers that call your grandma and tell her to send, you know, a, a box full of cash because they accidentally over refunded her and, or they're like, you know, whatever. They're scammers, you know, and, and, and they're thieves and they're bad people in this group. And the Pharisees, some Pharisees are really bad, but not all of them are bad. There's actually seven schools of Pharisees and some of them are quite good. Uh, some of them are even like, we would consider them like hippies today, just like peace, love. Some of them are uber strict. But anyway, the Pharisees who just want to honor God with their lives are watching Jesus eat with sinners, and this is a problem for them. It's culturally, like, to, to almost, forgive me, but to communicate what this would have felt like for the Pharisees. Imagine you found out your pastor, Bobby Shuler, last week went to a strip club and took all the strippers out to dinner to give them a Bible study. <laughs> you know, I bought them dinner, and how would you feel? <laughs> How'd you feel about that? You know, you wouldn't like that at all. So, by the way, I didn't do that. I've never, I don't plan on doing that. <laughs> well, anyway, that's really what it would have been like, where they're trying to reconcile the fact that God calls us to be pure and good and righteous. And yet here's a guy that stole money from my uncle, and Jesus is eating with him, which is like a way of saying, brother, I'm, I'm honoring you. And it's like, we're supposed to be good people. What are you doing? Knowing this and hearing him mutter, Jesus looks at the Pharisees, and he tells them three short stories. And they go from 100 to 10 to 1. The first one is about a shepherd. Now, in Jesus' day, when you hear shepherd, by the way, picture a girl. Would you do that for me? In Jesus' day, 99% of shepherds were teenage girls. It would have looked like this girl, about 15. Sometimes they were boys. King David, of course, was a shepherd. He probably would have been about 11 or 10. So if it was a boy, he would have been a child boy, prepubescent. And if, and, but most cases, it was teenage girls. Uh, just under marrying age, and their job was to care for the sheep. It's so funny when you see these images of old men with beards, you know, taking care of sheep. Not realistic. Anyway, uh, and in the story, you know, the sheep, remember, are like uh, community property, and they were like pets. I remember I had a dog, Maya Puppers. It was a black lab. She was half black lab, half golden retriever, but in her heart she was like all golden retriever, you know what I mean by that? She was like the sweetest dog. Every time we left, she would try and break out, and I remember one time we came home from dinner or something, and she was gone, and all night we were looking for a dog, you know, Maya Puppers, Maya, where are you? And we didn't know where she was, couldn't find her, finally went to bed without a dog. We're going to go to the pound the next morning, we're not sure if she's there, we're not sure if she's in trouble. And then the next morning when she comes out, you know, she was at the pound and she puts her hands on me and she's yelping and, you know, and dogs get all excited. Have you ever lost a dog or a cat or a pet or something? This is what Jesus is trying to invoke. They lost, there were 99 sheep, one gets lost, and the shepherd goes out to find her sheep and she can't find her. And she's like, lamb chop! Where are you, lamb chop? <laughs> and finally, when she finds her sheep, she throws it over her shoulders and runs into town and tells everybody, I found! him I found him I found him and Jesus looking at the Pharisees says this is what heaven's like when one sinner when one lost person comes back to the Lord so it goes from 100 then to 10 he says or the kingdom of God is like a, a woman who lost a silver coin in this story he's talking about a reference to in those days when you were married I think we have a picture of a Jewish bride from the first century when this woman was this is she's actually in her wedding gown and everything that she would have worn. But after, in a normal day, like going to the grocery store, picking up the kids, she would have kept that headband on and it had 10 coins. Now this one's wrong. I don't know why they have like 13 or 14. It should be 10 for the 10 commandments. And, uh, and it's like your wedding ring. It shows you're married and it's a pretty thing to wear and it holds your hair back, you know, and it's a nice thing. And so this, in this story, she lost one of those coins. And she looks through her whole house and she can't find it. She's looking everywhere for the stupid coin. It's silver, so it's valuable. Can't find it anywhere. You know, she, so she's out, and there's like this missing just ring with no coin in it. And everywhere she goes, you know, she goes to her mom's house. Hey, where, you know, you're missing your coin. I know. You know, this kind of, this had this conversation a million times. And one day after sweeping and everything, she finally finds it. And she tells all her friends. She gets them all together. Guys, look, I finally found it. I found it. I found it. And pops it back into place. God says that's what the kingdom of God is like without you. It's like it's not complete without you. 
My family is not complete when my son is missing. My family is not complete when my daughter is not home. Come home. And then finally, to drive the point home, Jesus tells a story about, we call it the prodigal son. The sermon is actually today is called prodigal father. You know what prodigal means, by the way? I grew up thinking that word meant sinful. It doesn't. It means either overly generous or wasteful in your spending. So you see, the, the person in the story that's overly generous and wasteful is the father, the image of God. In the story, there's a father who owns land. The land's been in the family for 100 years. And he's got two sons. And the younger son is the black sheep. And the older son is the one who likes to lecture the younger son and remind him that he's better than he is, you know? Maybe you have an older sibling like that. Maybe you are the older sibling. <laughs> I've been a little bit of both. I'm a middle child. So the younger son tells the father, I want to sell my, I want my inheritance now. And they probably got an argument or something. And saying, I want my inheritance now is like saying, I wish you were dead and I just want your money. And astonishingly, the father sells a part of the land, gives the kid the money. He leaves, spends all of his money on prostitutes. So it was just like, a, like and, and then has nothing left. And finds himself with the worst job in the world for a first century Jew. He's feeding pigs, okay? So in a Jewish mind, a pig is, a, is an unclean, disgusting animal. So he's not only impoverished, he is not only a fool for dishonoring his family and wasting the money you know, in this horrible way, but now he's feeding pigs, he's like lowest of the low. It would be like, to, the best thing I can think of is imagining your job is to feed spiders, you know? And you're out there feeding your spiders, and one day you come to your senses. It's just disgusting, creepy, gross. He says he comes to his senses, and he realizes, like, okay, my dad's not going to accept me back as a son, but if I go back, he will for sure give me a job as a hired hand. I'm just going to go home, ask for a job, and at least I'll have three square meals and a roof over my head. On his way back, he begins to say the story to himself, over and over. Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just hire me as a hired hand. You ever done that when you got in trouble? You're going to go when you're a kid, you had to tell your parents, you know, you got a D on your F on your report card. You know, this is Irvine. It's probably you've got a B on your report card. And you're, <laughs> but anyway, you know, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. But, but you know, so you're, he's going back. He's on his way home and he's just saying this to himself over and over and over. And finally, when, he cut, when he's, he's like in range of his parents' house, the, the father has been looking out, waiting for the son to come home. And it's like every single day for months, maybe years, he just can't wait for his son to come home. And when he sees the sinful wretch of a son covered in mud and pig dung and barefoot and filthy, probably can't even recognize him hardly, his hair is long and matted, the father, with no regard for that, runs out to his son. When you run back in those days because you're wearing, you know, this robe, you have to pick it up like a girl and run like this. You know, there's like no, it would look silly. He, this old man runs out to his son. His, his son is mid-sentence. Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. And mid-sentence, the father just throws his clean arms around his filthy, dirty, stinky son, tears in his eyes. He puts a robe on his back, which is a symbol of honor. He puts a ring on his finger, which is a symbol for family authority. And he puts shoes on his feet, which is a symbol for freedom. He's been emancipated from slavery. And he has them kill a fatted calf, which is what you do at a wedding. I mean, it's like the biggest, most expensive, elaborate meal. And everybody's invited. And it's like what we learn from this story is, is in God's view... You are either, it's not good or bad. It's home or not home. It's home or away. So that when you're home, even though you're dirty and flawed and mistaken, you're home and you know things are going to change. You're going to get a bath. You're going to get a shower. You're going to get some shoes. You're going to get a fatted calf. And Jesus says, there's, this is how it is in the kingdom of God. When someone comes home, there's more rejoicing in heaven over this one person. Won't you come home to the Lord? Won't you just come home to Him? Spinning your wheels and overthinking and 
saying all ways that you're a bad person. You're not. Just give your life to the Lord and begin to build your life as a response to his love for, for you. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And you'll see that your life, you'll become a more moral person and all those things. But first, you, you land at home with the Lord. Well, the story doesn't end there. Just one last part of the story that I think is very interesting. There's a, remember that other son, the older son? He is not into this at all. He's coming home from work. He's maybe got a shovel over his shoulder or something. And he sees in the distance a lot of lights. And he hears a bunch of music like you would in an inn or something. And all of a sudden he smells this delicious barbecue. He is not sure what's going on. He asks one of the servants, hey, Bill, what is going on? It says Bill in the Greek. Bill, what is going on over there? And, and he says, well, my lord... Uh, your, your younger brother has come home and so your father has killed the fatted calf for him. And it's like in that moment, he's just like, no, no way, no. And he just like maybe takes his shovel and just starts digging and he's just kind of feigning work, you know. This is what I do, I work. I'm responsible. I do what's right. You know this kind of thing? We all know somebody like that. <laughs> and... The father comes out to the older son. He runs out to him, the older son, the same way he ran out to the sinful son, you see? Prodigal. He says to the older son, why won't you come in? Why won't you come celebrate with us? And the older son says, that son of yours. Notice he doesn't say my brother. That son of yours took our family's land, sold it, spent it on prostitutes, insulted you, insulted me, and now you kill the fatted calf for him? And he said, you won't even kill a goat for me and my friends, and yet you kill the fatted calf for him. And you know what he says back to his son? He says, instead of saying my son, he says, your brother, I love it, he just throws it back at him, he says, your brother, he says, my son, everything I have is yours. You've always done what is right. And he says, but your brother, insinuating that you should have gone after your brother. You should have talked some sense into him. You should have pursued him. You know, he says, that brother of yours was lost, but now is found. Was dead, but now is alive. Won't you come in and celebrate with us? And you know what the brother does? You know what he does? You don't. Nobody does. Because that's where Jesus ends the story. He finishes the story with a hang. It's like hanging. And he's looking right at the Pharisees, sitting with a bunch of sinners. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and finishes the story. And he's saying, what are you going to do? Are you going to join us? Or are you going to wallow? See, and I think that's, that's the other part of the story that gets so lost. Is that there's a, there's a type of, of sinfulness also that comes in legalism. And in a pride of, of, of condescension towards others that are not as good for me, but that's not the life in the kingdom either. God wants freedom for you. He wants freedom, goodness, life in, in you now. And so I just, I just want to invite you, as, as a father would run out to the younger son or the older son, maybe you identify with one of those characters. You've always been good, but you, 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 you've been a good kid, a good person, but you don't have any sense of freedom or life or spirit or power from the Lord in your life. Or maybe you are a sinner and you're like, Bobby, I have no, you have no idea what I've done. I, I don't have an idea what you've done. But I know there's no saint without a past. There's no sinner without a future. I know that. I know that's true. So I think the Lord is saying to you, just come home. It's so simple. Just come home and know that you're loved by him. Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. And you are so kind and good to us. You are, the Bible says you are, God is love. We thank you for that, Lord. We receive your love today. And we ask that you would give us uh, your Holy Spirit to understand how it is we're supposed to become. Lord, we give our lives to you. We trust you. You're our loving Father. We thank you for your love for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you for joining us in worship today. This Easter season, Hannah and I want you to know that you have a family and we invite you to come home. God's message to you is that you are loved and you are his chosen. He is your friend and you are the apple of his eye. Nothing you go through can separate you from his amazing love. That's right, Easter means victory. Jesus is victorious over death. When I reflect on the struggles I faced in my past, I can see that God reigned triumphant in all of them. And when I look at my current challenges, I have faith that the victory is already won. He has the final say in the circumstances of my life and in yours. Friends, whatever struggle you may be facing, God's arms are strong enough to carry it. The resurrection matters because Jesus is alive today and he's working in and through you. You have a divine destiny and your best days are ahead. To empower you in your walk with God, we've created special resources to help strengthen your bond with Jesus and equip you to share your faith with others. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, PO Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland. 1344 or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website hourofpower.org.nz. As Jesus makes our spirits come alive this Easter season, he invites each of us to renew our vision, realize our dreams, and join him in the vital work of expanding his kingdom both here and around the world. This is the mission of Hour of Power, and it's why you are such a blessing to us. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we.